As we approach the start of the fourth quarter of 2017, where do we stand? Equities certainly have had a good run this year. And in fact, if you look outside the FTSE 100, you're looking at well into double digit percentage gains for many of the markets around the world. And we're talking here benchmarks in the States and the Asia Pacific region and across much of Europe. But the FTSE is up just what, shy of 6% year to date. Let's get some more now with Richard Hunter from Wilson King Investment Management. Richard, welcome. Um, what do we know so far this year that can help us get some sort of idea as to how Q4 is going to behave? I think it's fair to say for the first time in a long time, we're in something of a synchronised uh, global recovery economically. Um, there are clouds here and there, notably in the UK, of course, with the, all, the, all the uncertainty uh, around where we currently are. But if we cast our mind back just 18 months or so, particularly with regards to Europe, we were talking about debt mountains and the debt situation. Growth wasn't being mentioned. Whereas now, of course, we're in a situation where uh, growth is looking reasonably healthy in Europe. Uh, the ECB, we expect, uh, in the next month or two, will make some sort of noises uh, about the tapering of QE. And of course, the US being a couple of years further down the line uh, in terms of uh, that particular issue, um, are already signalling to the market as much as they can uh, that they're looking to, to run down their, their balance sheet a little way. So I think the thing of the, that may well characterise 2017 is that um, economically it's going pretty well. And in a, lo in a lot of ways, um, investors as well as companies should be making the most of that. Yeah, but you say this, I mean, debt is still there. We haven't got inflation, so we're not inflating the debt down. And um, growth is there, but it's well, anemic at best, isn't it? Uh, so we're not actually that much further on. Now, we've heard recently from Neil Kashgari, a Fed member, saying that damage is being done by the US Fed raising interest rates. We expect another interest rate rise come December. If that's the case, then what little growth we've got is going to be wiped out by us tightening Bank of England, European Central Bank. And we now know, of course, the Fed's already on its tightening cycle. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the US, of course, um, all things being equal, raising interest rates should be seen as a positive because the, the economy is strong enough to withstand it. They're not going to derail their own um, economic recovery uh, by the same token, of course. And, and they have to be very mindful that another slowdown and or recession will come whether that be a year, 18 months, in terms of a normal economic cycle, if they were still at current levels of interest rates, they'd have no powder whatsoever to reduce rates to help the, the economy at that stage. So that, that's one of the uh, difficulties that they've got. But you have to say, um, it might not be um, full employment, but it's getting near full employment in, in the US. People might not necessarily be um, working as much as they want to. Uh, and of course, there's the ongoing debate about whether the employment situation is structural or cyclical with so many more processes being automated. Um, but by general standards, and certainly uh, compared to over the last decade or so, um, this has been about as, as good as it you know, has been. OK, let's, let's take a look at the, some of the numbers I quoted at the top about the double percentage gains uh, for some of these benchmarks around the world. I think the best out of this has been the Dow Industrials up 22.4%. So we've seen almost almost a quarter of its weight added this, this year to date so far. But FTSE 100 up 5.6%. Why? Well, it's the constituents of the FTSE, of course. Uh, anything up to 70% of uh, FTSE earnings are from overseas. Had a bit of a fillip last year because we had the sterling weakness after the referendum vote. In terms of comparatives, of course, that's now washed through. So whether sterling is weak or not, um, that's still going to continue to help the exporters and so on. But generally speaking, that sterling effect, which has been uh, a drag on the market and was a help to the market last year, it is now one of those reasons. Again, in terms of constituents, if you look at uh, what we've got in there, the banks have had a reasonably hard time for any number of reasons, regulatory or otherwise. You've got a lot of miners in there and of course a couple of rather large oil companies as well. When you start adding some of those together, uh, that's a fair chunk of the FTSE. So it's, it's another one of those reasons that perhaps uh, a bottom-up approach in terms of the FTSE is, is uh, perhaps a better, better idea. Yeah, and in fact, if you look at the FTSE 250, I think that goes some way to explain that, doesn't it? The fact that the FTSE 250 has outperformed the FTSE 100, I think, hasn't it? Because of its uh, domestically uh, um, uh, pointed sort of companies. Um, so uh, Q4, you've mentioned, mentioned banks. Um, if we're in this tightening cycle, us as the consumer, how well are we placed? Are we able to, res, uh, to, to withstand higher interest rates or are you worried about the debt burden, which as I said is still there? 
I would be worried about the debt burden in normal circumstances. But to put this in perspective, um, even if the Bank of England reversed uh, last year's cut, and let's say we're at now at half a percent. If you go back to the formation of the Bank of England in 1694, historical, the average historical interest rate has been four and a half percent. Um, so in terms of normalisation, there is a long, long way to go. If we got to four and a half percent plus uh, in, in a pretty short space of time, that's when the consumer would really start to get stretched. But at these historically low levels, uh, it's con containable at the moment. Yeah. Do you have a, a, a preference in terms of geographical location to be in terms of investment opportunity at the moment? I think if you... Um, uh, often, uh, regardless of the, the problems they've had over the last 10 years, if you look at a company like Prudential, uh, they've got a foot in a number of camps. They're, they're starting to benefit from the baby boomers in the States, who are obviously um, now looking at the investments they have had. There's a very similar situation going on in the UK where uh, the need for younger people to um, provide for their own pension is, is almost becoming mainstream. And of course, they've got a very strong presence in uh, the Asian markets, China in particular, where a burgeoning middle class is also starting to think about investments uh, as much as anything else. So a company like Prudential, which has got uh, exposure to each of those, and is very much a, an investing uh, stock rather than a trading play, uh, is the sort of thing um, where um, longer term you can see um, that it's, uh, it's still got a lot of growth potential. What about uh, miners? You mentioned uh, mining stocks and the FTSE is well known. Here in London, we raise a lot of money, of course, the mining and mineral sector uh, generally. So it's, it's, it's good to be here in London for those stocks. But um, what about the mineral space? Yeah, I mean, um, again, so many things, uh, so many of these things come back to China. Chinese demand, which again um, has been on something of a tear this year, which has uh, uh, been responsible for a lot of the uh, uh, improvement in commodity prices. Uh, India is often overlooked. Again, you've got the urbanisation, rural story going on there. You've got the infrastructure spend going on there as well, and obviously by population, a, another uh, massive country. So that tends to be a, a demand supply story. Um, you've got the additional complication which, uh, whereby commodities are priced in dollars, of course. Um, in fact, these mining companies have got so little to do with the UK, it's just ha it just happens that that's where they put the, uh, the brass plate above the door. Yeah, uh, defence stocks, we've got to talk about those because of the heightened uh, security worries globally at the moment. Um, um, I've been reading that um, some are definitely going to benefit from what's going on, obviously. Uh, is that a good place to be in your mind? Yeah, I mean, ag again, um, Stock specifically, some have had a better time than others. Rolls Royce has had a couple of problems. BAE systems perhaps uh, a, a bit less. Um, but in terms of the fact that um, general defence spending, particularly with, with what we're hearing with North Korea, for example, uh, general defence awareness and general defence spending uh, are both getting on for being as, as high as they can be. So again, you need, to, you need to pick your stocks carefully, but in terms of the sector as a whole, um, that certainly has a future. Yeah, um, we've been watching recently the records in the States. Um, the NASDAQ has taken part in those records. And I know that we, we constantly refer to the, the tech sector, but I mean, this is driven by a small handful of absolute behemoths, isn't it, in, in the sector. Is that trend going to continue? Do you see the Amazons, the Apples, the, the Netflix, and whatever it is that's, that's driven the, the, the rise we've seen this year <coughs> continuing? Um, Apple continues to uh, confound its critics. Um, so we'll see how the iPhone 8 and the next iterations come. Um, Amazon seems uh, to be um, spreading its wings into so many different sectors, you can't help but feel that that still has a long way to go. And in fact, in some ways, uh, and I think we were speaking a few weeks ago about the amount of uh, half uh, $500 billion companies that are currently in the States, in some ways it seems to be a race to the $1 trillion mark, whether that be Microsoft, Amazon, or, or indeed Apple. Um, but again, we are in um, a world where um, it's almost becoming odd to be describing a technology sector when technology mm. is involved to such a large extent in any mm. traditional sector. So uh, the fact of the matter is what's going on underneath the bonnet in terms of technology is driving pretty much everything we do at the moment. And those ensconced companies, particularly in the US of course, um, still have untapped markets, as we've seen by Apple trying to get into to China, for example. Yeah. Um, here we are on this um, first day of this last week of, 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 of September uh, 25th. We've heard bad news out today from uh, Chinese house builders because I think the Chinese uh, lending rules are beginning to change. We saw a big drop today in Hong Kong.
long for those stocks. Are there any areas where you would rather not be or you're trying to sort of extract your clients away from because you're worried about Q4 for a certain part of the, of the market? Um, I, I think it's, it's difficult at the moment. The thing with China, of, of course, is that for individual investors, it's very difficult to get in there directly. Uh, you can do it usually by funds managed or, or, or otherwise. Um, as such, that tends to be an extremely volatile index, even though in terms of the economy, the Chinese think, in, think of things in terms of decades, not, not minute by minute as we do in the West. Um, there still has to be some question marks over Europe, depending on how the ECB play the unwinding. And you have to say, on the basis that QE has been a, a fairly large financial experiment, there'll be close eyes uh, on the US as well over the, uh, over the next six to 12 months and how they do start to tighten, notwithstanding the fact that a lot of those uh, record highs that you've mentioned in terms of the US indices has been on the basis that US companies have really delivered the high expectations the market has had to be able to justify their PE uh, ratios uh, and they need to continue to do so. Yeah, it's all about earnings. Yeah, Absolutely. Richard. Thanks so much indeed, Richard. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Richard Hunter is from Wilson King Investment Management. Uh, taking a look ahead there from what we've learned from Q3 and uh, looking out to, to the Q4 period for 2017.